Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome back from lunch. Um, I'm really grateful that everyone has uh, been here today. I know you have important things to do, and this is uh, something that's important to the School of Architecture, and we appreciate your time being here, uh, especially uh, so many students coming out today. Grateful to see that. Uh, we have, uh, I think, and perhaps biased as a co-moderator, uh, a very important discussion about housing this, this afternoon. Uh, the topic of this panel is called Housing, Displacement, and Justice. And in Los Angeles, Mexico City, Islamabad, Detroit, and Houston, housing displacement and gentrification occur at all class level levels, yet deliver disparate impacts on specific communities and persons. What can we learn from diverse approaches towards building equitably with housing as a catalyst for equity? We have a, a wonderful panel here, a very diverse multidisciplinary panel to discuss this. Uh, we have Andrew Hersher, who is an associate professor at the University of Michigan, Taubman College. Uh, we have Faiza Motasim, assistant professor of architecture, USC architecture. We have Lorcan O'Herlihy, uh, who's a professor at the USC School of Architecture. And we have Arturo Ortiz, the architect and artist, Mexico City. And unfortunately, Rick Lowe uh, was ill today and unable to join. But I think we have plenty of uh, super talented folks up here to share their thoughts with you. Uh, I'm going to ask that we keep our questions until the end. Uh, we'll have short presentations by each of the panelists followed by a discussion uh, led by Maria and myself, and then we'll open this up to the audience. I'd like to ensure that we have plenty of time for audience questions. So uh, we'd really, if you have questions about housing, please uh, don't be shy. We'd like to have a good discussion. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce uh, Andrew uh, Hersher to present. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm very happy to be here, very happy to have an opportunity to contribute or, or to try to contribute to uh, a conversation on housing and justice. I think that this conversation is urgently necessary in schools of architecture. But I also think that conversations like this often initiate a contradiction when they take place. And this is because architecture, to the extent that it is only accessible to people with access to capital, or the state, or the state's philanthrocapitalist emissaries, this architecture is inaccessible to the planet's subaltern people, the people that Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth, the people that Hannah Arendt called the scum of the earth, the people that today appear in the places that we inhabit, in the global north, as people out of place. Refugees, immigrants, the homeless, the impoverished, the indigenous, the excluded, which is to say, the only people whose words and actions and lives can open up to a truly transformative justice to come, or equity to come, or democracy to come. Now, it's true that architecture is becoming increasingly involved with certain categories of subaltern people. But I would argue that these occupations typically involve the substitution of what should be called rightless relief in the form of architecture for the political rights that are irreplaceable for any meaningful participation in justice or equity or democracy. The title of our panel puts housing in relationship to justice, but to suggest that architecture's involvement in housing could advance justice when vast swaths of humanity across the globe are structurally underhoused, structurally unhoused, and structurally dehoused is to perpetuate incomplete formulations of justice that pass for versions of the real thing and preempt the emergence of a truly transformative justice to come. 
To work through this, I think, is to rethink architecture, to rethink architecture as a discipline that's centered on design, whether it's the design of housing or anything else, and think instead about architecture as the production of knowledge about the built environment, an environment that not only houses people, but also underhouses, unhouses, and dehouses people, which is to say an environment that registers in very specific and in very particular ways and very precise ways the contradictions and betrayals and disavowals and blind spots and failures of our current concepts and current practices of justice, equity, and democracy. The preceding, these contradictions, betrayals, blind spots, disavowals, and failures, these are the only points of departure for a transformative justice to come or equity to come or democracy to come. And I think that architecture in the, in the, in the expanded form that I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting here has a unique capacity to be mobilized on behalf of those transformations. And what I'd like to do is turn to a very brief example of this mobilization that I've been involved with through my work uh, with the We the People of Detroit Community Research Collective, which is uh, a, a, a research project that came out of an organization called We the People of Detroit, which was founded in 2008 by a group of mothers of uh, 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 students uh, in the Detroit public schools who are resisting the privatization of public education in the city that you already heard a little bit about uh, in, in Scott's talk. In 2014, We the People became involved in supporting community members whose water was shut off when they fell behind in water bill payments. To augment protests against mass water shutoffs and to support equitable water policies, some of us came together to document the social consequences of the city's shutoff program in a, in a, in a form that we thought could be legible and vivid to policymakers. Among other things, uh, I would like to pose our research as a kind of architectural knowledge production that recenters architecture's disciplinary imagination around the core concerns of communities and that repositions architecture's accountability away from academic institutions and away from professional institutions towards those communities. So in this sense, our research documents the ways in which Detroit's water crisis reveals a host of fundamental yet disavowed dimensions of democracy and capitalism in the built environment. This is something that, that, that you could think about as aqua democracy, the form in which democracy appears when the focus is the distribution of water across race and class differentiated communities. In Metro Detroit, the city's mostly black water customers not only subsidized the regionalization of the water department, and Detroit's uh, water and sewerage department is one of the largest in the United States, so the, and, 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 and Detroit's mostly uh, black water customers not only subsidized the regionalization of, of this department to serve mostly white majority suburbs that were inaccessible to them, but Detroit's uh, uh, mostly black water customers also subsidize water itself, as their water department sells water at wholesale rates to suburban water authorities, rather than at the retail rates that Detroiters themselves pay. At the same time, in black majority Detroit, water customers can have their water shut off when their bills are unpaid for 45 days or longer, while in the mostly white suburbs, water authorities offer far longer periods for bills to be unpaid before shutting off water if they allow water to be shut off at all. As, as Scott discussed in his talk, water shutoffs in Detroit massively accelerated after the city was placed under emergency management by the governor of Michigan in 2013. And this was also another spatial manifestation of racism as emergency management has almost always been imposed on Michigan's black majority cities and almost never on its white majority cities. If you're a black Michigander, there's about a 50% chance that you have lived or live under emergency management. If you are a white Michigander, there's a less than 3% chance that you have lived under emergency management. Um, and this involves the separation of people from houses. Um, what you're looking at here is a map 
uh, of, of water shutoffs in Detroit. Now, because water bills, unpaid water bills, go on your property tax bills in Detroit, um, water shutoffs have led to uh, uh, and accelerated uh, the, the massive uh, uh, tax foreclosures that have taken place in Detroit that, that, that Scott also discussed. A house, regardless of its architectural quality, cannot house anyone if its residents can't pay their water bills. And in the United States, soon, close to uh, a third of the people who live here won't be able to pay their water bills. So one way, I think, that architecture uh, can participate in uh, a, a, a transformative justice to come is to think about how to uh, 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 um, support the ability of uh, 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 the people who, 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 who dwell in architecture to pay their water bills. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, my name is Faiza Motasim, and I work on urban informality, um, and especially try to trace its relationship to formal uh, master planning. Um, my objective today is to uh, discuss and introduce informal spaces as an architectural category. How do marginalized people make space for themselves in a city that has no place for them? Many people living and working in cities around the world without access to public housing programs and other kinds of institutional support end up relying on informally developed spaces like squatter settlements, tent encampments, street vendor stalls, and hawkers kiosks to fulfill their basic needs for shelter and livelihood. These spaces of ordinary informality, serving the economically and politically disadvantaged communities around the world, are easily recognizable on the basis of their material characteristics. So what you notice in most of them, are the, in most cases, are these makeshift structures put together using a mix of available building materials and simple construction techniques in order to create urban forms that follow principles of incrementality, heterogeneity, and improvisation. A close reading of the materialities and modalities of these ordinary informal spaces shows how their forms and aesthetics play an important role in their long-term survival. For instance, during my research in Islamabad, uh, the high modernist capital of Pakistan, designed in 1959, which is similar to the high modernist capital cities of Brasilia and Chandigarh, I have noticed how poor people work, how poor workers in a wealthy city use certain material uh, materials and construction techniques to sustain their informal spaces, often for very long periods of time. So broadly speaking, there are two kinds of informal spaces built by marginalized communities in Islamabad. In the first instance, informal structures are made mostly out of natural materials, such as mud and straw, or mortarless stone. Roofing for these structures are similarly made out of other natural materials like wood, uh, wooden beams and joists, which are covered uh, with mud and thatch, often with a layer of um, sheet of plastic for waterproofing. In the second category of ordinary informal structures in Islamabad, dwellings and kiosks are made out of more modern building materials and construction techniques, such as brick masonry walls on a concrete slab foundation and roofs made out of steel structures covered with tiles or fiberglass or co even concrete. The difference in the material properties of squatter settlements and roadside kiosks in Islamabad is based on a number of factors, most importantly on whether or not they are recognized by the state. People who live in unrecognized squatter settlements or work in unlicensed tea stalls deliberately avoid using building materials and construction techniques that are perceived to be permanent. This aesthetic of temporariness is based on the presumed properties of um, certain building materials and techniques and not on their actual strength. Uh, because like brick and steel, mud and wood are not structurally weak materials. These materials give the impression of impermanence and are selected deliberately by their builders, um, in mostly living and working in precarious conditions, 
um, who recognized the importance of participating in the rhetoric of temporariness in making informal claims to space. The point I want to make here is that the selection of materials and construction techniques associated with informal spaces in Islamabad and other cities around the world is not arbitrary, but follows a logic of informal building that ensures its long-term survival. This logic of informal urbanism, which I call long-term temporariness, allows informal spaces in breach of official master plans to exist for long periods of time as long as they can be categorized as temporary. Temporariness is a state of provisional existence. Labeling something temporary creates the effect of tolerance, of allowing certain concessions for activities that cannot be otherwise accommodated on a more permanent basis. So in the case of Islamabad, um, I've also um, found out that designating informal spaces as provisional um, is also a part of um, a creative uh, bureaucratic strategy um, based by city officials, which is similarly based on the assumption that temporary provisions um, could be allo allocated to certain informal uses um, with, the, with the assumption that those could be resolved more permanently at a later stage uh, which may or may never um, come. So for instance, um, just to give an example, officials use the term, um, the official term for squatter settlements in Islamabad is kachiabadi, which literally means temporary settlements. Um, the municipal codes of Islamabad authorize licenses, temporary licenses to roadside kiosks uh, with the understanding that they could be revoked on a 24 hour notice, so on a very short, uh, on short basis. While collective organization and action of marginalized populations against exclusionary policies and practices are essential to avoid evictions and other forms of dispossession, um, I want to emphasize that architectural forms and aesthetics play an important role in helping marginalized populations make informal claims to space. By avoiding the use of architectural forms that are perceived to be permanent, marginalized people in cities around the world from Islamabad to Los Angeles, deliberately adopt a practice and aesthetic of temporariness as a tactic of survival. In the case of forced demolition or eviction, it is this quality of temporariness that allows informal spaces to bounce back once the immediate threat is over. While this strategy of long-term temporariness does not make a city more equitable, it helps make unequal cities more accessible. Thank you. Right, pleasure to be here and uh, to be part of discussing these critical issues with regards to these key issues of housing and displacement, among others. Uh, uh, part of my background is from Dublin, Ireland. I was uh, um, uh, educated in Europe and I was always fascinated by public space, always fascinated by social space, uh, which I always felt was lacking in a certain ways in Los Angeles. So this was a seed that I was always interested in pursuing. So I am interested in urban life. I'm interested in public space. We live in a time where we have become more and more connected through social media and other technologies, which quite obviously is also isolating us in a very big way. Uh, but we are trying to understand that it is time to shift back and uh, create spaces that are away from social media and create the critical component of engagement with people. People want to communicate to each other, and this is what we try to bring within all of our work. So it is more critical for us to design those spaces. As we look at the urban sprawl of Los Angeles, where my practice is based, one of the densest conditions in the US, with all its freeways and neighborhoods, and not nearly enough open public space, it is one of our tasks as architects to find opportunities to design spaces that shape interaction and cultural evolution. It's important to design cities as dynamic networks, from top-down solutions to generative bottom-up strategies, both of which are achieving a greater connectivity and diversity. This is what a city is about. This is what urban culture is about. Here you're looking at two uh, bottom-up strategies uh, that are truly about taking back the public domain in a guerrilla way. On the left is a project by a collective of artists uh, in the 70s called ASCO, um, whose work was influenced by public policy and planning that was creating economic and geographic disparity in East Los Angeles. In this image, you can see how they are reclaiming the city. On the right, you can see a more common scene, a group of skateboarders 
who quite literally carving away public space and reactivating it in inventive ways. And certainly I saw a lot of this living in Venice for over 15 years. This is crucial. This tells the story. This is about the community. This is about what they want. <clears throat> Needless to say, movements as these uh, guerrilla movements does lead to more considered spaces of social space and have inspired many contemporary planned public spaces as skateboards, uh, skate uh, parks and parklets. So this idea of a seed of an idea planted and then it develops into a more institutional or productive solution, which is about people, but it comes from the people. And this is very fascinating how Los Angeles is evolving in this way. One of our projects is called Isla de Los Angeles, which is uh, located in South Los Angeles. It's working with Clifford Pierce Housing, a wonderful organization who provides uh, a permanent supportive housing. It's located uh, next to one of the largest interchanges in the world, the 110 and the 105 freeway. Over the years, uh, certainly since uh, the CRAs were uh, uh, abandoned many years ago, uh, there were sites that were available to be provided for nonprofit developers to develop uh, projects such as supportive housing. When that went away, the opportunities went away. Right now, based on uh, resources and uh, new funds, they are now providing occasionally sites. This site is one of them. We teamed up with Clifford Beers and we were selected for this particular site. It is um, a 35,000 square foot uh, project and it's on a 19,800 square foot triangular site. You may see it there in the site, right at the confluence of the 110 and 105. It's a triangulated site. It's a challenging site, needless to say. Uh, it's a composition of cobbled together odds and ends. There's no water availability. There are no other resources available. There's no water hookups. There's neither power or anything else available. We had to work with the city to try to cobble up these three sites to create one site to provide this uh, supportive housing. This is the challenge that you have. Needless to say, it's also in a very impoverished and polluted community, needless to say, given that the freeways are there. These are the challenges we have as architects, is to find these very complex, challenging sites and make architecture, make housing out of it, but always recognizing and acknowledging the social equity has to be brought with it. So this is a view of the Paseo and the project. Uh, it's a mix of supportive housing, ground floor storefront space, spaces along the Paseo, and will provide, a space, uh, uh, provide space for job training, supportive services, and administrative offices. What's also fascinating is this Paseo was a road, Athens Way, between the freeway and our site, which was given to our clients by the city to create, in a way, a very democratic pro uh, a strategy, where it's also for bike riders and also for pedestrians. This is a very unique approach where we're designing the housing project, and Annenberg Foundation provided $2.5 million to develop this road as a paseo. It will act as a green lung, and it would help to filter the diesel particulates and air pollutants from the freeways, really important issue. Uh, the landscape is site-specific with trees and shrubs and vines, which are chosen for their ability to clean the air. This is one of the very unique scenarios where you're designing housing, for supportive housing for the homeless, in addition to the road, this idea of social engagement with the street, but actually creating this opportunity for people to be able to filter out of the, house, the housing and be able to engage the city and the community. A public space, but also one that's for everyone. <clears throat> it will bring, bring equity. <clears throat> in addition to that, we've been deeply involved with working in Detroit. Uh, it's a very complicated moment with De uh, in Detroit, and given that today is just about sound bites, I'll, I'll make it very brief. All of our work is in the neighborhoods in Detroit. The challenge was to address that and great, engage it and design work for the communities in those neighborhoods, not simply downtown Detroit, but in the neighborhoods. So we've been commissioned a number of, of uh, by the city of Detroit to look at two different studies, Northwest Detroit and another area, Russell Woods and Arden Park areas. And it's been very extraordinary for us to be able to see uh, how to develop and propose ideas for those areas. It was all about the artists. It was all about what they created. And that was the seed of the idea. So the areas that we suggested encouraged development would be in those areas, but for the people. Uh, this image here, you can see that within the residential area, in a particular area in Northwest Detroit, we're proposed to take some of the houses and bring libraries and bring public spaces within the residential area. So there's a hybridizing of programs. So you can walk to it. So the idea is, can you create an environment in a community where you can walk to the, walk to buy some food, walk to go to the library? And this is a strategy that we propose with these uh, studies we did in Detroit. <clears throat> 
Equally so, we're uh, producing projects there. This is a 156 unit building of co-living, which is under construction. This challenge was unique. We initially started with this project that was engaging Wayne State University, Motown, the other areas that are surrounding it, and we had a kind of hybrid program in this project, which was bringing everyone from those communities to live in the, in the particular building. Given that architecture is a messy process, uh, it turns out as we're developing it, the price of construction went in Detroit jumped over 30%. To make that work, we have now reformulated the building, uh, it's really good to be flexible as an architect, and turned it into a 100% co-living project, which means more beds, but also can be available for the young professionals, for students, for the community that's surrounding the buildings. There's a, a very large residential area as well that there is a need for housing. So this project is engaging everybody around the community and it's for them. Again, really critical to bring that aspect of social equity to the neighborhoods in Detroit. Here's two views of it. <clears throat> a very exciting project, and it's very interesting also, we're working with locally sourced, locally sourced vendors uh, that we're working with the automotive industry who will be involved with uh, producing the exterior building envelope. And you'd be surprised how brilliant they are in terms of looking at metal uh, and producing really interesting forms. The last project I'm gonna show briefly is back Jump cutting back to Los Angeles. This aspect of trying to take buildings and engage the street and the sidewalk is essential to architecture. It simply isn't about designing these isolated objects. It's about working with politics, social aspects, working with economics, working with smart strategies, and developing work that is about the city. It's about engagement, it's about social justice, and it's about producing the type of work you need to do in which in 20, 30 years from now, as cities grow in scope and people keep coming, that it's a place where you want to be. And that's our role in Responsibility Architects. And there's a, a last few I'm going to show you. This shows it up the, uh, uh, in other words, the exterior living room. This is for people in the building to go out and hang out and engage, which is a very important aspect of this 26 unit building for families. These are homeless people who have been on the streets. So out of the 26 units, over 23 are for families, which is an extraordinary shift with regards to that uh, particular um, uh, need that we need in Los Angeles. Families are on the street and it's essential that we address those issues. Thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Uh, it's really, really interesting to hear uh, such different uh, disciplines uh, in interacting and uh, changing ideas. Um, Mexico um, is a country with a lot of, um, with a diverse expression of expressions of urbanism and urban plans and urban projects. Uh, and we have um, a really complex uh, situation with uh, informal, I, I'm going to stop it. Okay. Okay. Um, with informal settlements, but as well with um, uh, large uh, state policies for doing housing. And uh, today I, I will share with you some ideas of this, um, or, 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 a, or the context of, of the uh, formal housing uh, for workers and middle classes in Mexico. I feel much more comfortable to read it, so let's do it. During the 1990s, state in institutions of social and economic development in charge with providing housing for workers, real estate companies and financial institutions transformed laws and regulations that favored the new model of housing production in Mexico. The reform of Article 27 of the Constitution and the transformation of the tenancy of ejidos uh, facilitated the regularization of rural plots in order to turn them into urban land. The process was strengthened with the 1983 and 1999 reforms to Article 115, which consolidated municipal authority in the determination of urban plans. Besides, fiscal decentralization in 1996 granted fiscal resources to municipalities without political cost so that they could finance their development. The municipalities had the autonomy to define their urban plans but lacked information and incentives to develop orderly cities and connected with other urban spaces. Uh, the process that accelerated the production of housing, and when I say uh, accelerate, I mean 14 million houses built in 16 years. Uh, the process uh, that accelerated the production of housing was 
the 2002 reform to the law of Infonavit, the Institute of National Workers Housing Fund, whereby it was converted into financial entity and left the construction to residential developments to private initiative. Thus, the municipal presidents made a pact directly with the housing developers without having the structured criteria or clear urban development plans. As a result, extensive portions of, te of the territory were left adrift in the market. The structural transformation achieved a successful economic mix in which real estate companies could acquire rustic plots of land at low cost, modify the agricultural land use for urban use, create development plan, plans in collaboration with the municipalities, and construct enormous residential neighborhoods made up of thousands of small, identical single-family homes disconnected from other urban spaces. These residential developments include no other land uses. Um, in, include no other land uses. The neighborhoods offer 34 to 60, 60 square meter houses characterized by poor construction quality and located on land that are ill-suited to such placement, lacking decent infrastructure and spaces of public access adequate for social exchange, political action, and respect for diversity. In addition, their location depends on economic feasibility of the land as a result of which they tend to be isolated in the middle of nowhere. In conjunction with this, the new agreements of housing production established financial services aimed at members of the middle classes who were formerly employed, to whom mortgages with very high interest rates were offered in, uh, in an unfavorable situation for cons consumers. The large affordable housing neighborhoods in Mexico during the first decades of the 21st century, have systematically constructed urban situations in which people cannot come into effective contact with the state institutions. This is, in the first instance, a physical obstacle since in most cases no public institutions are represented with, uh, this housing uh, within these housing complexes. Residents live lives develop in places where access to their rights is geographically distant, involving an elevated cost of mobility to reach them in an environment where the way in which individuals might have access to the law and public service is illegible. It is imperative to recognize that the large housing developments on urban peripheries are an expression of housing policies spearheaded by the state, the consequence uh, of which is a separation of life from law. In addition to, to the isolation and precariousness of the housing development themselves, the housing model does not allow for a space in which difference among residents, differences among the residents uh, about matters that are relevant to them all could find a space for dialogue and debate. The architectural configuration of the complexes prevents any meeting places from emerging. Pre-established public spaces are limited primarily to streets and precarious park with playgrounds for children. These complexes have no architectural or urban planning feature which, within which residents could organize for political action. At the same time, the state institutions function based on abstract notions of housing and well-being that are easily reduced to numbers and statistics. As a result, they have created built spaces that produce the material means for men and women to establish relations among themselves on the basis of an absence of state rules. They can do whatever they want without consequences. I quote Hannah Arendt, Fear is the will to power from impotence, the will to dominate or else be dominated. This situation implies the need to produce public security schemes, thus diverting the possibility of an individual connecting to public institutions or law in favor of a connection primarily to the police. Through the shaping of the space, the spatial uh, context, the expectation of private property, the financial scheme and fear, society is contained, resistance is neutralized through urban disconnection and difference is criminalized whenever some sort of social organization is achieved. In my opinion, the successful economic model derived by social housing strategy in a democratic Mexican context 
is not able to bring political agency to, for the people, create better quality of life and well-being for residents. Instead, instead, they seem to be understood as machines to enable a rapid and profitable fabric. Thank you. Maybe one of the implicit promises in this panel is that housing is where architecture meets the full force of finance capitalism. Uh, so housing, especially for those uh, who are not in position to enter the real estate markets, could arise under conditions that are not determined only and ruthlessly by the so-called market forces. Um, this is where architects, I believe, can really find agency uh, in redefining a sense of uh, social equity. So uh, Dinkeri brought up earlier the right to housing, the, the right to the city, uh, highlighting that housing must first and foremost be considered as a right, uh, not a commodity, in order to, for cities to, to survive, right? So, however, internationally, not just in the US, the housing component of welfare state has effectively been taken off the table as an option to mitigate the worst aspects of socioeconomic inequality. So the housing question is, in this case, as much a question of what can be thought or what can be imagined as it is a question of what can actually be done. Uh, so I would like to open up the conversation uh, to all of you by asking how, how are we situated as architects to help bring social change to our cities uh, by using housing as a catalyst for equity? Well, okay. I'll, I'll start. I mean, thank you for the question. To me, though, your question is symptomatic. Um, it's symptomatic of a dynamic in architecture wherein there is a constant return to the state and to capital to um, find its lost agency and its lost social relevance. And I think, in some senses, what, 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 what you heard on this panel, um, and I'm thinking of uh, Faiza and uh, Arturo's presentation, is the exact opposite. It's not turning to the state. It's turning away from the state. It's not turning to capital. It's turning away from capital. And there, in those moves, I think architecture can find what I think you're looking for, which is agency and social relevance. That's why, to me, your question is, 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 is uh, symptomatic and, and, and might prompt other questions. Uh, well, I, I think that probably we, we should think of urban uh, design and urban planning, not just in terms of shapes or consumerism, but uh, as well in terms of um, bringing um, a connection uh, between the people and the state, mm. uh, between the people and their rights, the, the possibility that the people can effectively um, uh, ask and demand for services and rights. Uh, and I think um, um, architecture and urban planning is, um, is an op a discipline that uh, brings an opportunity to do that. I can just uh, jump in in terms of my experiences. Uh, if an architect can be a strategist and be involved early, with projects where uh, the seed is planted by the politics of the project, where it is, the economics of it, you can play a larger role. We have always been found ourselves in a position that brought in later on in the game. And that's something that we've been pushing and I believe architecture should go. They should be strategists. They should be deeply embedded and involved early on to help bring and contribute information at, in that process. So we do try to change and bring uh, uplifting spaces within cities by being uh, from inside out. We do think that you can build ideas and you do have to engage through politics, through the dynamics that create opportunities. And that does not mean, that does mean you have to engage develop, development and working with nonprofit organizations and working with the city. The Isla de Los Angeles project is an ideal situation where we push for this idea of having a paseo, created a social uh, 
engagement uh, created an environment for that project to exist. Uh, that road that is right next to our, student, uh, our supportive housing project was not part of the project initially, but having been involved early, they agreed to, uh, in, uh, to add that to the equation. And that, I believe, is what architects have to do. Be involved, work as strategists, and be involved early. And I would just add, um, <clears throat> add to that, that by saying that, um, so housing is a, is a pretty complex category. It doesn't exist in the same way globally. So I'm thinking, here I'm not thinking about public housing programs that are funded, that have a budget for an architect and so forth. Um, and here in particularly I'm thinking about how the way you know, people house themselves without uh, professional um, input. And when I think about those kind of spaces and how, you know, talking about our agency as architects and people um, belonging to this profession, um, I don't think that we have quite yet uh, figured out what uh, housing means uh, in those contexts. I think we need to find, um, uh, you know, we need to figure out what it is, um, and uh, that would, I think, lead to a complete rethinking of our, what architecture ought to be. I mean, these ideas have been around since the 1970s, but they haven't really, I don't think they've been picked on um, in, in a more constructive way. So I think when you're dealing with uh, no budgets, with people who are marginalized that have no legal status, um, what would housing look like, and I mean, what you know, what can we bring to that struggle? Mm -hmm. And that would not necessarily mean building an apartment block, but something else. Thank you, everyone. I have a question about the deepening inequity that we see in our culture, and we can use housing as a lens for viewing that inequity. Uh, traditionally, in the United States, house ownership or apartment ownership, any type of ownership of your housing, one's housing, has been uh, part and parcel of uh, participating in wealth accumulation and the idea that citizens would have some ownership stake in their communities. Uh, increasingly, we see wealth consolidated uh, by fewer and fewer owners and a greater number of people uh, paying money to those owners uh, to, to live, but without actually accumulating any wealth. Uh, what is your view, uh, each of you, uh, on the role of the ownership of housing, and whether those residents of housing should aspire to be owners of that housing? Well, at least in the in the particular context I present in Mexico, uh, which is this um, social housing uh, properties, uh, much of the, um, um, uh, almost every time these houses um, are really really cheap to build in spaces uh, in 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 plots and terrains uh, also really cheap. And, but they sell these houses really expensive, and then they have to add, uh, uh, to have a, a, a mortgage, which is like really, really expensive as well. If you buy one house in Mexico, you must pay at least three. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and the and the quality of the houses and the location of the houses, um, in a way, uh, it's a. Um, it's a situation in, in, in which you cannot uh, uh, add value to these properties. The, 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 the value of the property will be, uh, in the better case scenario, the same uh, as the, they, they buy the house without the mortgage uh, value. So uh, in this case, I think it's much more an, uh, uh, an exploitation kind of system uh, in which what they are, uh, what the system is doing is um, uh, make a, a worker or a, a, a man profitable for the state or for the system. So the, the, who, who is going to get the profits probably is not going to be the, the owner of the house. Probably will be um, a bank or a developer or, or in, the, in a political perspective, the, the governor or the president in turn. I had a thought about the idea of shared culture. Now there is a generational shift, and given out of because of need, they certainly don't have the resources are not available now as it was perhaps my generation. The cost of housing is so exceedingly expensive in Los Angeles that perhaps it's the idea and the embracing that culture, shared culture, where it's not about ownership but it's about engagement, and that is the value. That's the one that could drive uh, the future with regards to that issue of wealth and ownership. 
that's what we've been experiencing, and quite obviously, even in Detroit, it's not only in Los Angeles we've experienced that, but in Detroit. This project I showed was initially not a full co-living project. It was just a portion of co-living. That had to shift, but it also shifted from people in the community who live there and said, we can't even afford to live here now, even in the neighborhood of where that was, Milwaukee Junction. So they worked with us to, and we re reformulated the building into a 100% co-living, meaning more beds, meaning it's a, uh, it's, uh, the, it was affordable. And they loved the idea of this idea of shared culture within that building. Um, I would just say that um, over a decade ago, Hernando de Soto, uh, economist, uh, and again, my responses are uh, limited to uh, my understanding of informal housing. Um, so this economist uh, very pro uh, proposed um, formalization of informal housing, and uh, the way of doing uh, that was by giving land uh, title to the people who lived in informal dwellings. Um, and that, uh, that didn't quite work in the, in the play in situations um, in which it was introduced, only because um, title means um, that you can exchange something as a commodity. And so what ended up happening in many places was rather than lifting in informal, uh, people who lived in informal housing out of uh, the traps of poverty, um, they ended up just relocating to another place and uh, you know, selling their titles to um, someone from the middle class, lower middle class. So I think it's tricky when you're dealing with very, very, very impoverished populations and um, when it comes to home, um, like land ownership and property, um, it doesn't, it, 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 it's a tricky terrain. Um, and so in many ways, uh, enabling um, them in, uh, and supporting them in other ways might be more beneficial rather than giving them a piece of paper that has a title on it. Jeff, your question makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> so even sadder than maybe I just wake up every morning. But I, 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 maybe I'll just share why. I, 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 and I think I know why. But, uh, okay. But yeah. well, I mean, to ask to own or not to own is to already take off the table so many other questions. It takes um, off the table the question of colonization and decolonization. Mm -hmm. To own or not to own on, 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 on colonized land. That, that, is, that cannot be asked. Um, um, it takes off the table any real economy of sharing. And I don't mean not sharing like in a co-living space in Detroit. I'm talking about the kind of sharing that's, that is the ambition of um, any any sort of um, socialist or or, or communizing project. So so to, to answer that question, one has to already answer all sorts of other questions that don't even get to be asked. But I think it's also interesting, you know, going back to, to that point. There's, there's a resistance from, you know, kind of an American philosophy of ownership, right? Um, and I, I think as architects, one of the questions is how can we uh, change that public perception of, of ownership, right? How can we, uh, I think, to, to some of Lorcan's uh, work, actually, by proposing communal spaces and starting to think that the house uh, could be somehow um, um, opened up to, to sharing spaces. We, we've seen some of the research done on the East Coast with a kitchenless uh, work and so on. I, th I think those are really interesting typological conversations that maybe architects can utilize as a way of, of, of changing that, that, phil that philosophy or that public's view, right? Um, of um, I would love to just respond. <laughs> we have discovered having building these projects or building these ideas that the people who live in these communities or buildings see it as a community. And that's the idea that they embrace. Not that they own it, but that they own the idea that this is theirs. And then this shared environment is something that embraces it. And that's something that I'm, I, I'm, I do believe that is the, the future. It's about creating that new environment where it isn't about ownership. It's about the bigger idea. It's not about ownership for the people who, who get fucked, it's, but it is about, it remains about ownership for the people who benefit from that. And that's the problem, if you see what I mean. In other words, architecture participates in giving people a sense of ownership, a sense of dignity, um, a sense of respect.
a sense of recognition, what are those things, really? What can you do with those things? And what can't you do with those things? Where, where, wh 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 how do those things uh, enable people um, to participate differently in, in a political system? How do those things help people pay their water bills? Those affects of dignity, respect, recognition, ownership. That yeah, I, I do. There is an idea of empowerment that one gets from that, and that this sense of empowerment has certainly been proven to be a great asset. What we've discovered. So there is a. It's an interesting discussion. I completely understand. It's a very unique scenario, and we have to change it. We have to find a different alternative approach. We have to provide housing. There's also this whole argument of permanent supportive housing. Permanent is ideal because it provides in the, the emphasis of this, you can stay in this place if, it, if we're talking about homeless housing or supportive housing, if you work together as a community. And that's what's interesting. Uh, so there are ways in terms of the idea can be a sense of ownership of the idea. I would, I would maybe ask the panelists, because there's such a wide spectrum uh, toward the approach of, of ownership from uh, current models of capitalism to uh, the uh, complete restoration of indigenous land and uh, new models of community that I would ask uh, each of you to speak to the mode of uh, home um, uh, that, that in, in terms of its, its relationship with capital. So to each of you, what do you think the relationship between housing and capital should be? In my opinion, um, I think your question lacks from another actor, which is uh, politics. Not politicians uh, necessarily, but uh, what we need probably is uh, spaces in which we can create a political uh, agency. We, we can be political actors and we can uh, ex explicitly ask for demands and probably we can create cities or, or, or create uh, housing uh, projects in which you have these uh, benefits. Uh, I'm, I think uh, the state uh, at the same time is, is really relevant in these issues because the, the laws and the regulations are allowing um, um, locate the profits in, in, in one uh, specific uh, part of, of, of the system. How can we share the, these profits? Is, is it possible to, to demand uh, as, uh, as a society or as architects or, or as urbanists um, other way to distribute the profits of, of, of the land and the profits of the of the uh, development, uh, because if we cannot do that, uh, probably uh, we don't have like really a lot of options. Right. And I, I, I would like to clarify that I said uh, capital as in financial capital, not necessarily financial capitalism. Okay. So capital is necessary whether it's distributed by a government because the government has been paid by the people or whether it's an independent developer or whatnot uh, doing that work. So at some level I'm wondering about who uh, pays for the housing to be created and who uh, exerts ownership over that housing. That's my question. Okay. Can I just uh, say something about that? Um, you know, when I think about housing, and this is something that we talk a lot about in my, one of my classes, um, where we discuss, okay, so uh, how one, might one solve um, the problem of um, homelessness or the problem of um, just inadequate housing globally in, in the in slums and squat settlements where, you know, people are really subjected to some very difficult conditions. And um, oftentimes we arrive at the consensus that um, it's not about uh, having money to make an X number of units that will solve this problem, but it's actually a problem of um, social and political inequality. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, we, in LA we are seeing um, the permanent housing, supportive housing, and you know, all of range of models being uh, implemented. Um, but, you know, statistics show that, you know, they replace, uh, let's say, 30 uh, homeless population, and the next day there you have 40 or, you know, on the streets again. So the problem is not just about building units and architecture, again, uh, thinking more 
you know, more uh, non-architecturally in some ways, mm -hmm. where you're not building and putting money mm -hmm. into building things. Um, but you know, the, the problems are, uh, are, it's about inequality. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I don't know. I would just build on what Faisi just said, and I think architecture could very profitably stop asking questions like the one that you asked, which is a very, very understandable question, and instead uh, try to develop an infrastructure of listening so it can learn to learn from below. And what would, and I guess um, just to press you with everyone else, what would your model of housing appear like? Where would people live? How would uh, housing be established? We, that, we don't have to figure that out. That, that, that's the point. Yeah. That's not, the, you know, who wants to know that? Who needs to know that? That's to me. So for two and a half years, my students have been making these cardboard chairs. And it bothered me a lot because they were throwing out another excuse for making something pretty. So I switched it to a cardboard shelter and this notion of shelter loosely defined in terms of problem solving, we had an incredible discussion during this whole notion of what architecture can solve. And, and I, you know, I admit it, we can't solve exactly what you guys were talking about, but they're in the middle of putting together a project which is due in a week, which is going to be, like only three weeks they have to do this, but they actually, put themselves in the shoes of being homeless so they can figure out what they might need. And so we're gonna get solutions of self-care partitions. We're gonna get um, universal blankets made out of cardboard, things like that. So if you pose these questions on a level of where students can actually really engage, because they want to, they don't wanna just do the formalism stuff that we've been giving them for the last 25 years. And they're doing it for us, and I think that we need to listen more to our students and what they want. Yeah. The, the, thank you, Mina. That's what our, our goal up here is to do, actually. We would like a passionate discussion. I would just want to just jump in, and we, needless to say, we're all living in Los Angeles where we have this massive crisis, as we all know. And part of the issue is the cost and the capital to be able to produce these uh, housing projects. Uh, each unit is $500,000 plus. Um, the solu one of the solutions is to really dig into why is it that expensive? What are the issues involved? We've looked at it a little bit. We've been involved with the Citizens Oversight Committee with regards to the, uh, in the city, who've been uh, uh, put together to address these issues. How can we reduce that cost? There is uh, a, an absurd requirement for parking when it comes to supportive housing to this day, which makes no sense. Every subterranean or on-grade parking can cost close to a million dollars in these type of projects. Equally so, there are, uh, until recently, uh, land had to be purchased by nonprofit developers, so they were carrying that mortgage for three to five years when they were trying to get these uh, tax credits, which is a very o overburdened process, where if you simply don't get in the pipeline for one, for it for one year, you have to wait a year, and they're carrying that mortgage. Needless to say, then they need greater resources to be able to cover that. If one can get away, uh, get, get rid of the idea of uh, having to purchase land but actually lease it, mm. as they do in Europe, where you have a land lease, that's another way that you can reduce costs. So parking, reduce costs, and, and be strategic and be a good designer as an architect and design efficient buildings, but bring uh, in, uh, optimistic buildings, ones that engage people and are uplifting. So if you provide intelligence in terms of how you design these buildings and address issue of parking uh, and, and get rid of it and look at ways in which one can look at land and the cost of land and get rid of that. Those are three key issues that will reduce that cost. And if one does that, then you might be an opportunity to build more, which is needed. And that's what we're having is such a difficulty in Los Angeles. It's the cost of building these products and the length. Equally so, we're, we're doing a, the project we're doing in Isla is actually a container project which was encouraged to us by the city council. They were interested in the idea of finding a quicker way of building these uh, units. So they will be uh, uh, developed and built in factory as we're doing site utilities and working with the sites of the cities. So reduce time in terms of building it, address issue parking, address the land lease as opposed to ownership, and that will uh, go a long way towards uh, creating a, a greater approach towards providing more housing, and we need it. 
So, I think a question in the audience right here. Yes, hi. Um, I, um, I live in Culver City. We have 10,000 new jobs coming in through Apple and, and on Amazon and Google. Um, There's a population of 40,000 in Culver City, so we have 10,000 more coming in top of that. There's no housing. We have tra transportation is a major issue already on the rest side. How, how could we pick, you know, picking up on what you're talking about already as architecture? What do we do? At what point do we have companies that are moving in, like Amazon and Google and stuff, work with you in trying to create housing? At what point is it left to, left to the city? I mean, what happens? Would someone like to respond? You want me to answer that? <laughs> I've been talking a lot, so I'm willing to defer. Jeff, do you have an idea about it? Uh, um, it's a very big issue. It's about displacement. It, it, you know, when you're producing these projects for Amazon, among others, you're right. It's not for perhaps people who are there, but there is a. It's an important way to address that and work with them in such a way that you also look at who are the people who are there, and that's. Just, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but there might be. Uh, it's challenging because they are the capital. They understand. They have the resources. They're doing it. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think one thing that that I'll say that in my <clears throat> former life as the president of the LA Forum uh, for architecture and urban design on uh, uh, my co-moderator is, is still on the board. Uh, one of the things we're continuing to work on is community discussion with, uh, with the, the mayor's office and with community groups. So I think maybe, uh, Andrew, to your point about the uh, asking the questions, that's the approach in thinking about what housing uh, means in different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Uh, in response to new challenges is to say, okay, how can we set up uh, discussion points with all sorts of uh, groups of different communities in different places within the city, such as in Culver City being one of them, and ask what are the needs of residents? What are uh, the concerns of residents? If they could, uh, as residents of a particular community, imagine their future in some way, what would it look like? What would their values be? How would they address uh, um, these challenges? And, and that would be the basis for the discussion about, about these problems. There is, uh, Snap, Chad moved into Venice multi, uh, many years ago and created enormous issues within Venice, meaning the pricing went up the, through the roof, which meant that Venice, which it continues to be immensely expensive, once they left Venice, then the numbers dropped. So there is a significant issue about how when these large, comp uh, large companies come into areas and they consume all the, the, uh, the, uh, the buildings uh, and they are paying uh, top dollar for their employees, that the pricing goes up and it basically displaces people who perhaps are living there. And uh, when they left, and then it was a community uprising. They wanted Snapchat out of Venice. And they did leave. So it does have to be, you can do it, but it has to be bottom-up strategy in terms of if you come into our community, our neighborhood, you need to understand we are here. And we have to be part of the conversation. And uh, I think the Venice one is an interesting, interesting resolution. The city and the community of Venice had had enough, and they left. And the pricing did drop. So it comes from the people to be able to make a difference. Have a voice, a loud one. There's a, this, is, this, is not, this has very little to do with your question. It has more to do with the answers. I'm thinking right now of a, of a, of a, of a, a poem by uh, Tyler Denmead, which is, which is titled, White People Can't Be Humble Even When They Are. And everyone understands <laughs> that. And I'm thinking architects can't be humble even when they are because, ar ar because architects uh, we are, are so tied to the state and so tied to capital that it is very difficult, if at all possible, even when we listen to the people, I'm not sure it makes a really big difference because architects are accountable I disagree with to that. the state and, <laughs> and capital. I, yeah, I, I think there is a way of working and, and collective minds can lead to great work, solutions and um, that when you work with neighborhoods and the communities, my experience in Detroit, where 
you're from. Uh, um, we, I'm from we, here. Oh, you are. Forgive yeah, me. Oh, oh, no, no, no worries. Okay, right, no worries. Um, there, there, for us, it was an extraordinary experience to be really deeply engaged with the neighborhoods and, and really having these meetings. And I was able to bring ideas from Detroit back to Los Angeles in our work. And it was fascinating to be able to understand that in terms of how you pose a, a question or look for uh, or seeds of ideas from communities, uh, which worked better in Detroit for us. It doesn't really work here in Los Angeles as well. It tends to be much more a a a adversarial in Los Angeles. Detroit was more engaging. They were happy that we were there. And, uh, and there was reservation. Don't get me wrong. There was significant reservation about you know, are you really going to make a difference? Why are you here working in the neighborhoods? Is this going to happen? And that's still to be decided. It has not been resolved yet. But there was aspects that I had there that I think LA can learn from about how that engagement can come up with great, and you can come up with great solutions from that way. Um, thanks, Lorcan. Faiza, just a quick question for you. What, what does, in your opinion, what does justice for the displaced look like in, in housing? Hmm. <laughs> I think um, I'm going to draw on something that has already been written about um, since the 1970s uh, as an inspiration. I think um, justice for all marginalized communities means, um, to me, it means a, a way of uh, enabling them. So, um, and that can take on different forms. So. Um, so, for instance, if there is a, if there's someone who has a kiosk or a, you know who's trying to make a earning living, um, the state in many cases tends to uh, threaten them with eviction or just you know there's a, just a looming threat. So, I think just enabling those kind of opportunities um, would be a good first step. So, just letting people be and find um, you know space for themselves, which they already are doing, but under very precarious conditions. Can I just, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but another response would be to say, that's not for us to decide. And I mean, there's this habit of thought where architects are constantly asking, and that's us architects, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's maybe, there's many ways to frame this habit of thought. But instead of us asking ourselves, what does justice look like for them? Well, in, in the terms not? of Faiza's research, I think she's been, yeah. it, no, she's been sure, spending but, a lot of time on right, this work, but, but and I, I want to honor that. No, I totally want to honor it, too. Um, but another way that, to think about it is to say that it is not for us to decide. And this is why, uh, you, you know, I, it's, it's very different to talk about justice and to talk about justice to come. Just, we don't know. We cannot know what justice to come will look like. And, and if we... I think we can agree on that. Cool. Other questions from the audience? I have one. Hi. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I'm Andrea from, uh, from MIT. And um, Faiza, I was, I was actually I was stunned by your presentation. And I found it absolutely interesting um, because it reminded me of the formation of so many, um, so many things that the West has kind of stolen from informal economies is a lot of aspects of business models um, around informality. Uh, micro, well, uh, maybe more around uh, the social economy. When we harpen back to what is the social economy today, so much of that has come out of the informal economy. And so to, in relation to that idea, a lot of what you were showing with respect to housing was very fascinating to me because you were deconstructing a lot of what you were seeing in terms of form, but also in terms of social interaction. So to just swing back to the topic of the, the panel and how we were going to sort of resolve some of these issues around housing, what were you learning um, by deconstructing some of these forms, but also some of these social interactions um, that could probably bring more equity over to our world, which has lost so much of it? Right. Um, it's, it's very easy to answer that. Um, I was doing it for my own purposes. I was interested um, since my undergrad years um, in spaces that were not built by architects um, and often questioned um, in uh, the schools of architecture um, how was what I was doing architectural. So I, in order to answer that question, I, I decided to, okay, so let me see what is architectural about the spaces that, that I really find fascinating and meaningful. Um, so yeah, so that's what I was looking at, uh, trying to figure out, figure out a way to um, present these categories as architectural categories, as you and others um, already know. Um, they are often overlooked in um, discussions and histories of architecture. 
So trying to figure out, okay, what it is that there are the people doing, um, and then what might, uh, how might we see the, these spaces in, in, as doing more um, of um, than just simple structures put together, you know, in a shabby fashion. And I, w I was, um, I have to say, I, you know, this was just a small snippet of um, my larger, uh, you know, section of the, of the manuscript, uh, where actually I, I, you know, I was able to identify that this kind of understanding and relationship between form and architecture and formality actually runs deep. It's not just the people who are building this way, uh, but also the state recognizes it in its policies. So, um, so yeah. So, th for anyone who's interested in spaces of informality, I would just say, um, or any kind of spaces that doesn't look architectural, I would just say um, that you know, once you start deconstructing, you'll find much more than what is visually, physically, you know, apparent. But there's something deeper. So yeah. So I was just trying to answer this question of why, how is it architecture? Here too, uh, you have communities which are building informally and often get um, stigmatized or just evicted or marginalized. So I think uh, the learning is in uh, acceptability, uh, just for, you know, accepting, accepting for this, uh, these spaces for what they are and what they do, and then um, you know, taking it from there. The problem is that when you look at these spaces that look, that, that look a certain way, they don't look formal, um, the immediate reaction is that they need to be improved somehow. I think recognizing that this is, uh, these are already functioning communities and places that people themselves have, have financed. So that's where the capital is, even this money that people have put themselves. Um, so recognizing these spaces um, would be the first step, and, and that could be uh, something that could be applied globally in here too. Um, so I'd say, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't have a, like a better answer to that, but thank you for that question. I think actually it's it's really interesting that you bring up acceptance as a as a mechanism to 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 maybe um, confirm this kind of informality, right? And I think um, that you know how could we make that happen at a policy level, right? And I think that's where maybe Arturo's research comes in really interestingly or intersects because you know you were talking about mechanisms of isolation that were directed by by, by government policy, right? So how do we and maybe that's where the role of the architect could pot potentially come in, in recognizing the value in, in certain uh, architectural forms that, that we could somehow regulate. Um, so. Yes, uh, in my experience, I, I, I worked uh, for a lot of years in informal settlements in, in the east of Mexico, which is like the poor area of, of the city, no? Um, and then I started to research also with these housing uh, policies. Uh, from my point of view, um, the informal settlements in Mexico City are much more uh, uh, organized than the, the federal uh, strategy for housing. They are organized in terms not just about housing, but also about education, about uh, healthcare and a lot of other stuff. I, I, something I, I really learned uh, from them is that they don't have like this idea of a family house. Um, they are uh, building spaces so they can live in, in a better situation or in a, in a they, they are trying to create, create these shelves in which they can live. But they are not uh, thinking as a, as a family, probably they are uh, creating two or three spaces, uh, trying to attend like the urgent necessities, and also something that I I, I like about this uh, and I learned about these uh, spaces is that the the, the these houses uh, have um, um, use value. I mean, uh, they cannot exchange these properties because they don't have papers. So uh, everything they invest in their homes. Um, will be there, and probably when they get the papers after 20 years, at, at least in the case of Mexico, uh, any uh, penny they invest, they will uh, receive it back. So I think there are a lot of things that, that we can learn about uh, informality. Um, and also, uh, if you make a comparison be between the, the, the formal, the formal uh, strategy of housing and the informal one, uh, you will see that at the end of the day, probably the informal one is, is better. But the cost to live there at the beginning, uh, to get there and to start to build a house, and the stigma that you have 
uh, because of that, is really tough at the same time. So there is not a, a good solution or no, it, there is not a good uh, options that you have in uh, one or the other, no? But uh, at the end of the day, um, if I had to choose, I will go for an informal settlement. I'd like to open this up to questions uh, to the audience, if we may. Yeah, could go. Hi. Um, excuse me. There's a question. There's, There's a, a question right comments. here. Oh. oh, he has the mic. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is uh, for Faiza. Um, uh, I'll digress a little into an, another part of the world, which is Mumbai. Mm. It has a lot of uh, housing problems. And we have seen a lot of policies and um, approaches towards uh, redeveloping the tenements and chawls of Mumbai. But it was a bit of unsuccessful um, approach, I'll say, because many of uh, the residents did not take up the redevelopment uh, policies. And it was a structured um, approach to it because uh, organizations of, like, for, uh, of, of our community, architects and planners, did um, take up those policies and make those policies to redevelop the chawls. But it, it wasn't a success. So um, I think it was because of political uh, structure and the dynamics of uh, economics of that uh, um, slum, um, because it is valued at like $2 billion. So mm -hmm. uh, redeveloping or resettling to um, that kind of that huge settlement is a challenge. So how does um, like our uh, mediation as um, as mediators like how do we uh, tackle the uh, dynamics of political pressures and the economics of that space? So in Mumbai, um, what I'm familiar with uh, is the situation where uh, the land is really valuable, and so many of these slums um, are located in really expensive um, locations. So. Um, the, the, the driving factor for those projects is to free up that land um, so that it can be consumed by private developers for private uh, development. And so the motivation is the problem, right? So on the surface, it may seem like that these slums redevelopment projects are meant to actually help um, the people living in those situations, but in, especially in the case of uh, the Mumbai example, um, almost all of these examples, um, so all of these redevelopments included um, just freeing up land and you know sort of uh, sweeping the the slums um, into one corner in a tower situation, and then opening up the land for just uh, open market um, redevelopment. So I think that that is the problem. You know, when when um, so Peter Marcuse has written this uh, uh, article that call that's called um, I'm forgetting the name, but it has some some combination of. Uh, welfare, uh, public housing, and the myth of the welfare state. And the argument is that uh, oftentimes housing policies and housing programs get uh, framed as if they're designed to help the populations. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a mythical, so obviously he deconstructs that and shows how it's, it's, a, it's a myth. And so I think uh, when the intentions are not uh, what they seem to be, then you, know, you would have the result that you're describing. Um, so I guess uh, as, a, as an approach, um, I think I, I'm a big fa fan of uh, upgrading on site upgrading. So you, you have a, in a slum or squatter settlement and you upgrade what's already there rather than trying to formalize that and you know, clean, up, clean them up and put them in fancy towers. I think those um, situations really yield better results. Um, so yeah, so it, it has to be actually meant to improve the conditions of population rather than like um, um, sort of... Uh, cloak uh, other ulterior motives. You mentioned um, that the structures of in Islamabad of the kiosks and the uh, houses, uh, although temporary, uh, that the materials are far more stable and longer lasting than we would actually assume them to be. Um, but I'm wondering, since they're labeled temporary, do people on a regular basis come through those areas and ask for bribery yeah. on a monthly basis yes. to, re to remain standing? Absolutely. So this is um, a part, it's a, it's, it's a performance of many sorts, uh, performance on the end of uh, people who are actually building these structures. Um, they recognize that they don't have a legal standing, so they must build in a way that appears to be temporary. 
many of the spaces that um, I've shown um, have, have had long history, so they've been there for 40, uh, 30, 40 years. So, um, um, so, so, so that's the argument about the long-term aspect of it. But the state also um, uh, recognizes um, them as temporary, um, and so, so, um, so it, it makes these provisions, but those provisions are often, as you uh, rightly um, identified, come with a price. So it's, it, they have to part, uh, these populations have to participate in all those other things that uh, come with um, you know, uh, working in a an, in an precarious situation, which includes uh, bribing. But I guess the point I want to make was that architecture also plays a role in this, mm -hmm. um, in these processes. Uh, my name is Fidel Rodriguez. I'm an alumni of USC. I'm also Chumash uh, from Santa Barbara. My, I have six generations. Um, I'm going to also, before we start, acknowledge the Tongva, uh, whose land we are sitting on right now. Um, I wanted to pose a couple ideas and then a question. Um, a lot of stuff going through my head. Uh, Professor Hersher, uh, I want to acknowledge you for acknowledging the land, right? Um, I heard a lot about decolonizing. I don't know if we understand the root cause. Uh, the root name of that is Colon, named after Christopher Columbus. Um, to decolonize, I think it's not just about the architecture, it's about the mind, right? Uh, I read a book when I was living in Africa called uh, Decolonizing Mai by Ngui Wang Yanjo. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that when I lived in Africa, they had separated poverty into two different sects, dignity and without dignity. And what I've discovered is that capitalism, which came with colonialism, shifted the narrative of our understanding from the we, nosotros, right, to the I. And I think what Professor Herscher keeps bringing up is that we keep, especially being in academia, right, which I am not, but I do a lot of the work in the streets of LA, as I have for the last 25 years, creating decolonizing methodology programming for young people, especially young kids of color, color that are incarcerated. So my question is that as we're talking about decolonizing, right, we're bringing that up, is the architecture that is being constructed, at least here in LA, um, is it representative of cultural hegemony still? You know what I mean? And more importantly, the, the questions that he's bringing up, are the architectures, architects talking to the community? Because obviously we're here, but there's nobody from the community in here to even partake in the dialogue. As the Zapatistas, I was at the Encuentro in 1994, where we had you know, 10,000 people from 40 different countries dialoguing about these issues, and it's just not, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over weeks and years of continuing dialogue. The Zapatistas told us uh, it was an encuentro against neoliberalism, right, which we're all seeing the effects of it now. Capitalism is the root cause, but nobody ever wants to talk about that. And I'm bringing it up because I'm looking for the mind that's in here or up there or out there to figure out how we're going to fix this, right? Karl Marx said four alienations that were going to occur, right? whether it was in communism or capitalism, alienation of us connected to the earth. It's kind of obvious we're disconnected to the earth, right? Alienation of our work. Most of us work jobs we hate. Alienations from each other, right? The minds have a concept of in la que tu eres el otro yo, you are the other me, right? When I hurt, you hurt. And most importantly, disconnection to what? Alienation to what? Ourselves. No one's brought up trauma at all at all, and how does the architecture reinforce the trauma? Mm -hmm. So my question to everybody here is, is, are you guys communicating and having focus groups with the community prior to even the idea of what can I come up with? Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I just alluded earlier um, a process we're undertaking with, with communities in Los Angeles to consider what the nature of community is and what the nature of housing is. Uh, it's a long process. We're going through it all fall. Uh, and um, we'll have some ideas by, by the winter to discuss about Los Angeles. I'd love to talk with you after and, and, and connect you with that process, if, if I could. Um, and then, Andrew, maybe you, you would like to speak, speak just, to Yeah, uh, just one quick response is uh, it would be good for architects to talk to communities. It would be even better for architects to listen to communities. And, and, and that's, a, that's actually a, a huge difference. Because what that means is for our architecture to uh, 
um, give up on its agency, give up on the claims of its expertise, um, transfer its accountabilities. And, and that's the difference between talking to and listening. Um, and um, I, I think it's great that the, 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 this, the, this, you know, the, this uh, symposium, which is framed around the I issue of egalitarianism, equity, justice, and democracy, is, is, is at least op opening up to that possibility. Yes, well, in my experience, sorry, in my experience, uh, all, my, all my professional uh, work and all my research has been in uh, working in places uh, where I can learn from different communities and society, from Chiapas, in, in Los Zapatistas, to Antorcha Campesina, in Chimalhuacán and, and, and the east of Mexico City, to the, this uh, uh, large uh, neighborhoods I showed uh, today. And yes, of course, I, I think um, it's really important uh, to learn from the context, and in my case, uh, it has been like that. i just throw in a couple comments. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on that, uh, what I learned from Detroit was to engage the communities and the neighborhoods, and then trying to bring that idea to Los Angeles, which is a more robust but enormous bureaucracy here, and it's a much more challenging. There are steps in a process you go through. It's a long process here when you do projects and you meet neighbor communities deal with uh, ARBs, architecture review boards, but also the community is invited. But it's more about adversarial here. It's not as, a, as robust and uh, uh, you mentioned the idea of informal. Uh, that's an, a component that doesn't really exist here. Uh, it needs to evolve into that approach. Uh, so there are the, the seeds of the, that idea is, is, does exist within Los Angeles in a city of this scale. Uh, but it's more challenging. It really is because you sometimes represent your client or represent uh, um, uh, a nonprofit client and you go into these meetings and you do listen and you do uh, certainly uh, make adjustments and modifications to the solution, which is more commensurate for what is right for where it is. So the culture and the ecology of where it is is important and architects should do it. And that's what we try to do. So there are some people trying. Uh, but it is not easy, I completely agree with you. It's not that engagement that it should have. I, I think we probably... I think maybe as yeah. a close-up, um, yeah. I would like to thank the panelists. And I, I would say, I think one of the exciting um, key points that you all brought up is the, that idea of the, the rights to housing, right? So I, I think that's a very important thing to actually make explicit because whether it's, uh, you know, administered by, by the state or whether it's uh, proposed as, as a politica, political right, I don't think it's actually being articulated uh, today here. So um, I, I would like to finish with that comment about, you know, uh, the, I think um, as citizens we do have a right to housing and I think your research makes that explicit. So thank you. Thank you.